today our focus is going to be in actually um, creating a web page. Last time I showed a few tags, but that isn't creating a complete web page. That sort of um, I did that to introduce the concept of tags to you. Um, today we're actually going to get into the actual creation of a page. Um, and we'll, we'll revisit the notion of a tag and we'll sort of close the loop and, and complete it. Um, all right. Gilbert, Gilberto, Selena, Sean, Aaron, Devon, or Devon, Edward, Kenneth Mills, Sean O'Halloran, pardon me? Okay. <laughs> oh, you raised your hand for Sean, Sean Corn. Okay, right. All right. My, that, was, that was my fault. Um, Anthony Phillips is here, and Brandon is here. All right. So we're going to start out, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to open a simple text editor. And again, people have asked me, like, can you use Notepad++, which is something we have in the labs. Um, or other text editors, yes. The idea is, though, again, is we want, we want to actually code it from the ground up. We want to actually manually type in the tags and not use tools such as Dreamweaver or whatever where you can sort of draw your web page. Um, that, again, the equivalence I made of that is like, um, you know, making a, a cake from a box, you know. Um, it doesn't necessarily do it the best way, and you won't necessarily have the best results. So I'm going to open up Notepad. So I'm going to go to search notepad, and here we go. We're in a plain old text editor. There's no formatting at all. I mean, we can make the font bigger so that we can see it, but really everything that we're going to format on our web page is going to be based on our tags. All right. Remember, tags are what tell the browser what each little piece of text in your web page means. Now, you're going to have a bunch of text in your web page. You're going to have a bunch of words. Well, some of those words are going to be links, and some of those words are going to be the names of images, and some of those words are going to be headings, and so on. You have to tell the browser what is what. And just like a student might mark up their book and say this is important, this is not important, you're going to mark up your text, and you do that via the use of tags. So. Um, there's a handful of tags that are on every web page that you're going to That'll be our starting point. I'll put those in. First of all, the first thing we're going to do is not a tag. It's called a declaration, a document type declaration. Actually, it's been a long break, so I'm going to look this up. <laughs> yep, back type HTML. That gives the browser some information about what it's getting. In other words, when you go and visit a web page, you're getting back from a web server typically an HTML page. This gives the browser some information about what kind of HTML page it is. And specifically this says that this is an HTML5 document. All right. There are earlier versions of HTML that have other kinds of doc types. So if pe when people were writing in those versions of HTML, the doc type looked different. But this simply tells the browser, hey, 
you're getting an HTML5 document. That helps a browser be able to interpret it and understand the meaning of it. All right. Um, if none of that caught in, just put this at the top of every single page. All right. You can either like, know the reason or just know you have to do it. All right. Sort of the main, it's called the root tag or the root node, is an HTML tag. And this shows the beginning and end of the entire web page. All your tags are going to be inside of your HTML tag. All right. Again, simply more information to the browser to understand what it's dealing with. An HTML document consists of two parts, a head and a body. Now, notice a couple things. For every tag I'm typing in, there's an ending tag. The start tags look like this, where you have the less than sign, a word, and then the greater than sign. That's what a tag looks like. The ending tag looks the same as the start tag, except there's a slash in front of it. All right. So these tags go in pairs. For every starting tag, there's going to be an ending tag with only some minor exceptions, but we won't talk about those now. For our purposes, we can say for every starting tag, there's an ending tag. And this shows containment. This shows what is inside or the, the term that's used in web development is what is nested inside another tag. So we can tell by this that the head and the body are both contained within our HTML document. So when I say something is part of another tag or contained within a tag, it means it's between the starting and ending tag. So in this case, here's the starting HTML tag. Here's the head section. The head section is between the starting HTML tag and the ending HTML tag. The body is also between that. These two tags, however, are not contained in each other. The head isn't contained in the body, nor is the body contained in the head. Rule about nesting is if a tag starts within a tag, it should end within that same tag. So this is legal. The head tag starts within the HTML tag, and it ends within the HTML tag. So that's legal. This would not be legal, because the head starts inside of the HTML tag, and it ends outside of the HTML tag. Likewise, this would be illegal because the head tag starts within the HTML tag, but the ending head tag is within the body tag. So that is also not legal. Now you notice that I have indented these tags. That makes no difference whatsoever to the browser. It is just a readability thing. All right. In other words, we indent these tags so that we understand that this is part of the head, this is part of the body, and this is part of a section, and so on and so forth. So we indent that to make it easy for us, the people that are editing this code. The browser doesn't care. We could literally put everything on one line, all right? And if we had the start and ending tags correct, the browser would figure it out, all right? However, if you had to go and change something then, if you had to change something, and if you had a lot of tags, it would be very confusing for you to change it. So you indent to make it more readable for you. All right. The other thing that you notice, um, that, that you will notice, is that what's called white space or extra spaces doesn't matter to the browser. All right. It will take all the white space we put in and convert it to just a single space. All right. 
That's also a good thing because that allows us to format the page the way that we can make it more readable and more understandable. You know, anytime you do something, anytime you create a web page, anytime you create a program in other languages, you're probably going to have to go back at some point in the future and change it. All right, that's just the way it is. All right. Therefore, there's a lot of things that we do to make our life easier if we have to go back and change it. And one of those things is our indenting and properly spacing our web page. The head section contains one. To start out, the head section is going to contain just one tag. We're going to add stuff in there later on throughout the semester, but to start out, it's going to contain one tag. And that tag is the title tag. So, in this case, the title is My Page About Rabbits. Notice that there's a title tag and an end title tag. The title tag starts within the head tag and it ends within the title tag. Everything between start and end of the title tag is the title of the page. Well, what do we mean by the title of the page? Well, we'll see that in a minute, but it's going to appear here on the window. All right, it's going to appear in the title bar of the window when we open up the page within an, a, a web browser. So I'm going to put in a couple of headings. I'm going to put in a heading and a paragraph, let's say. Do you remember from last time, the tag that we did talk about is the H1 tag. And the H1 tag means it's the top level header. It's the most important header or, or headline, if you will. Think about it like if you were doing an outline for school, for, for an English paper. All right? If you're going to do a paper about rabbits, you might have, you know, here's my paper about rabbits. Um, you might have a section about the different breeds of rabbits. You might have a section about where rabbits are found. You might have a section about what, what do you feed rabbits, and so on down the line. So you'd make an outline, all right? You'd take a sheet of paper and make an outline. All right. So I would say rabbits breed Habitat, feeding, something like that. And then maybe under breeds I would have Flemish Giant. Dwarf so on down the line. All right. So I have an outline here. I have my main topic. Underneath the main topics, I have subtopics. And then underneath those subtopics, I have those topics divided into subtopics. Well, if we're making headings on our web page, your main topics are going to be H1s. Your subtopics are going to be H2s. And then your third level topics are going to be H3s. All right, it's just that simple. So it's not like this is going to be an H5 because it's the fifth heading. This is on the second level, so it's going to be an H2. All right, so don't think in terms of H1, H2, H3, H4, H5. Think about <clears throat> this is an H1 because it's the top level. This, this, and this are on the second level, so they'll be H2s. This and this are on a third level, so they'll be H3s. So you think about it in terms of like the level they are. How many levels do you have? You have six levels. Again, it doesn't mean you only can have six headings. It means you have six levels of headings. Is that enough? Yeah, it probably is. 
If you ever looked at an outline that was like more than six levels deep, wow, that's confusing. And in the case of a web page, that's probably a sign that you need to maybe break down the stuff that you have on one page into two different pages. All right, if you have that complicated of, of an outline. So six levels of heading should be enough for you. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to put into my web page just the headings for now. So we're not done with the web page, but I have a few tags, so I'm going to save it and I'm going to view it in the browser. Now again, here's something that's important. And, and every semester there's a few students that get a little confused by this. That's why I repeat it a lot. This is going to be one web page. There's going to be one file. It is going to be a .html file. We are going to look at that file two different ways. We're going to look at that file through our editor, which is what is like looking under the hood of a car. That's where we look into the guts of the page and where we make changes. We're also going to look at it in a web browser. And in a web browser is how the rest of the world is going to see the page when we finish it and publish it out on the internet. All right. So there's only one file. It's not as though there's a note. I've heard other people say the HTML file or the notepad file. Well, they're the same file. We're just looking at it two different ways. Just like the analogy I gave last time is an x-ray of you versus a photograph of you. Still only one you. It's just that there's different ways of looking at you via x-ray or via a photograph. So now I'm ready to save it. Now, when I save it, there's couple very important things to do, especially if you're using Notepad. I'm going to go up and say File, Save. <coughs> I can choose where I want to save it. Now here's the one thing that I think might lead to some of the confusion about there being two files. Notice how it says Text Document. You don't save it as a text document. You go and you change this to say All Files. And then you put in the name of the file and you include the .html extension. All right. File names have two parts. They have the name and they have the extension. The extension tells Windows or tells anyone else what kind of file it is. So we want to be clear that this is an HTML file. So I'm going to put in rabbits.html and I'm going to save it on the desktop. So now if we look, we see we have a file called rabbits. Now we don't see the .html, all right? But I know I did it right because I see the little blue Internet Explorer. That means that Windows knows that this is a web page. Now, it's important, and again, if I put my mouse on top of it, it says it's an HTML document. One thing that I strongly suggest doing, though, is turning on so that you can see the file extensions. Windows tries to make your life easy for you by hiding file extensions and by showing the type of file by the, by the uh, icon. And for like just your ordinary user, that's generally OK. They see the little W, they know it's a Word doc. You see the X, and you know it's an Excel document, and so on. But for software developers, we need to know, and web developers, we need to know the precise name of all our files. Now, this will become especially important when we start creating second web pages and linking to them, or when we start using images on our page. We need to know, is it a .jpg or .jpeg? Both of those are JPEG files, but the precise file name is slightly different. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go in, 
and this is different for every version of Windows, by the way. Um, the details of it are different. But this being Windows 7, I think, I'm going to go up to Organize, Folder and Search Options, under View, I'm going to click off Hide Extensions for Known File Types. So I wanted to show the extensions. So now, if we look at it, it shows the complete name that I stored it under, rabbits.html. All right, I'm going to close out a notepad and Word and all that. And we're going to open this up in a browser. I didn't have to close out of that. I just want to show you how you reopen a page after you're done with it. Let's say you come back the next day and you want to continue working on it. By double clicking on it, it will open up this page in a web browser. Now notice a couple things. Notice how our tags told the browser the meaning of the content on the page. And let me open it up in Notepad. So how do I open it up in Notepad? I go into Notepad. I can say File, Open. Again, I can change text documents to all files. And then I can find the particular file, the rabbits.html, and open it up. So, this is one page, one file. I'm simply looking at it two different ways. I'm looking at it through the editor, which is how I make changes to it. I look at it through the browser, which is how everyone else, when I finish the page and I put it on the internet. Web browsers are the programs that allow people to view web pages. So this is how everyone will see it. Now notice a couple things. First of all, how the tags told the browser what the pieces of text meant. Just like when I highlighted those things in the book, I said that this is going to be on the test, this is not important, and so on and so forth. So my title tag. My page about rabbits. If we look, my page about rabbits appears in the title bar. So the reason it did that is because I put it in the title tag. And if I minimize it, it will show me that that's my page about rabbits. So that's how I give my pages titles so that they show up in the title bar. I put it in the title tag within the head section. The other stuff in H1, H2, H3 are the levels of headers. And notice that by default, it makes each level of header, the lower the number, the bigger it is. So the H1s are the biggest level headers, H2s are the second biggest, H3s are the smallest. Now, notice I said by default, we're going to learn CSS that allows us to have control over how that works. All right. So we could do something a little bit different. Maybe we could make one bold and one italics, or one one color, one something else. But by default, H1s are big, H2s are small, smaller, H3s are smaller still, and so on. So usually what I do when I'm developing a page is I have the page open both in the browser and in Notepad. And when I make the changes in Notepad, I save it. And then I go and hit refresh on the browser window and see the new version of it. So let's say I can go in here and maybe put a paragraph in. Just a paragraph of plain text is a P tag. P stands for paragraph. And I can put in some paragraph of text about Flemish giants. And I'm going to cheat because I'm allowed to. And I'm going to go copy and paste an article from Wikipedia about Flemish giants. Get ready to say aw. Aw. Yeah, 
that's a that's a that's a big boy there. So I'm going to just go and copy this. It really doesn't matter. And I'm going to go paste it in my paragraph. And I'm going to go in here and I'm going to put an H1 for credits. And I'm going to put a paragraph that says information about rabbits from Wikipedia. Again, this is an example of crediting your sources. You do this if you're doing a term paper, right? If you had to write a paper about rabbits in some class, right? You couldn't just copy and paste. That's, that's um, plagiarism, all right? But you're allowed to quote things, you know, and, but when you quote things, you give credit to where you got it from. All right. So I'm just doing it so you don't have to um, be bored watching me type because I'm the world's slowest typist. All right, so I copied and pasted that in here. Now notice how that's all one big line. If I go in here and view the page, so I go and save it, hit refresh in the browser, notice how it wrapped it around, all right? That's the browser knows how much space it has, and it will adjust the width of the lines so that it fits in. And I don't even really have to do anything to do that. If, in fact, I put line feeds in here, the browser's going to ignore them. That way, I can, again, I can make my page a readable page. One giant line of text is very hard to read when you're editing a page and very hard to go back and make changes to. So I can go and put in the line breaks. All right. Makes no difference at all to the browser. Yes? Okay. Um, an ally, a list, is when you have a list of items. So I potentially could have done these, those headings as list items if I wanted to. Um, we'll use lists in a minute and we'll show an example. Um, there's, a, there's a chance that you might have uh, made a mistake with it because if you make mistakes with the tags, it takes a guess and it may or may not get it right. All right, Let's, let me do a for instance. Let's say instead of H3, I just have an H space 3, all right, a typo. Notice what it did. It said, hmm, I don't know what an H space 3 is, so it didn't do anything to it. It just formatted it like it was plain old text. Didn't make it any bigger. Or, if I were to spell title wrong, here, all right. Notice that's no longer the title. I get the word my page about rabbits there. Because if you don't use the proper tags, the browser has to guess at what to do. Because you, you haven't given the correct instructions. And again, believe it or not, sometimes if you guess, and you get it wrong, rather, and the browser guesses, um, Everything will look okay. Other times it will cause you grief. So if your list items didn't make any change to the page, my guess is that there was probably some small issue with the tag that you put in. And we can, we can take a look at that in lab. And we'll go over lists 
either today or um, um, next week. Here's a good one. What do you think this would do? I've misspelled the ending tag for title. This happens once or twice a semester, yes. It treats the rest of the page of the title because it looks and it says, my page about rabbits, all right? Is this the end of the title? No, it isn't. You know, very unforgiving. <laughs> it's not going to look and say, oh, he, that's what they probably mean, the end of the title. Nope, that's not the end of the title. So I'm going to scan the page and everything I find from here to until I find that end title tag, that's the title. Well, it hits the end of the page and never finds the end title tag, and therefore it thinks the entire page is a title. So, there's a page, it's blank. And again, sort of the good news of this is don't panic if you get a blank page, right? Because it could be something small, all right? And in this case, again, all I have to do is correct the end title tag. Now it recognizes that that's the end of the title, and the page will be displayed properly. All right? So that's an excellent point to bring up. The good news, oh, well, not the good news. The, the, the reality of the situation is, is if you use the tags correctly, the page will display most of the time the way that you intended it. Now, again, I realize I sound like a politician here, right? Shouldn't I say all the time? Well, there's things such as browser compatibility and so on and so forth. But with the simple basic tags we're using, if you use the tags correctly, your page should display the way that you intended it. If you do not use the tags correctly, the browser has to guess what you mean. And it might do it right or it might do it wrong. Let's make some other mistakes and see what happens. Let me put an end H22 here. Let's say I typoed. And instead of H2, I typed in H22. What did it do there? Well didn't see the end H2, so it assumes that everything from here until it sees an ending H2, which is down here, is part of the H2. So that's why this stuff is bigger. What if I nested incorrectly? What if I put this like that? It looks correct, kind of. I think it looks correct. You, in other words, have lucked out if you've done that. Because even though you have an error in there, it still displays it correctly. So let's review what we know about tags so far before we go into more tags. Tags tell the browser what the different content means, and that allows the browser to know how to display your page. If I simply have the words my page about rabbits here, the browser doesn't know what that is supposed to be. If I put that within a title tag then, the browser knows that's supposed to be the title and will display that text up on the title bar. Likewise, if I just had the words rabbits, breeds, Flemish giants without any tags, the browser wouldn't know what those are supposed to be and would just make them plain, ordinary text. All right, just in normal size font and so on. If I put them, however, within the H1s, H2s, H3s, the browser knows that those are to represent headings and display them like they're headings. All right. So, I could fill in some of these other things and I could put paragraphs in here and all that, but in the interest of time, I won't do that. Yes?
That's the only one for now. Later on there'll be other things, but for now the, the title tag is going to be the only thing in there. Every page should have the doc type, HTML, head and title, body, and then should have whatever is needed in the body. Notice that the tags come in pairs, starting and ending, and the starting tag indicates where the tag begins, and the ending tag indicates where it ends. All right? The formatting that we put in, whether it be indenting or new lines or blank space, doesn't matter to the browser. We do that strictly for our own readability. All right? We save the page as a .html file. We have to go when we save it and say all files when we save it in Notepad and put in the .html. And then we can view the page in Notepad and view it within the browser, make the changes in Notepad, then click refresh and so on and so forth. All right. Again, we certainly could put other paragraphs and stuff in here, but we'll leave that for now. All right, lists. That's another good one to cover. There's two kinds of lists. Ordered and unordered. Notice one thing I did there very without even thinking because it's just so ingrained in the way I do it. As soon as I put in the start tag, I put in the ending tag. I do that just so I don't forget to go back and put in the ending tag. All right. Unordered lists are where the list doesn't really, the, the sequence of it doesn't really matter. In other words, it's in an arbitrary order. So I'm going to list some things that a rabbit eats. All right. I don't have any statistics that says what the main thing rabbits eat are, and so I'm just going to put them in in some order. All right. If, however, there was a ranking, all right, like the you know the the, the you know the ranking in the the NBA Eastern Conference or something like that, where the order was not arbitrary where there were like some numbers behind it. The team that has the highest winning percentage is number one. The team with the second highest winning percentage is number two, and so on. Then you would use an ordered list. And we'll see the difference between the two, because I'll change back and forth between ordered and unordered. The idea of an unordered list, though, is to have a list that um, the sequence really doesn't matter. The sequence is kind of just whatever order I kind of figured out. Whereas an ordered list would be like, it matters the order that these are in. You know, a recipe would be an example of an ordered list, right? You crack the eggs, then you put them in the bowl. It matters if you do it in that order as opposed to putting them in the bowl and then cracking them. All right? So, a list starts out with either a UL or an OL tag, and then it has, inside of that, list items which are LIs. And the list items are the same whether you are talking about ordered or unordered. So what do rabbits like to eat? They like to eat hay. Oops. They like to eat lettuce. They like to eat carrots, of course, but you really shouldn't feed too many. There's actually too much sugar in carrots for rabbits to eat too often. Sorry, Bugs Bunny. And spinach, let's say. So there we go. An unordered list that consists of four items. So these, lists are, these list items are part of the list. 
So they appear within the tag. Yes. No. No. There's simply a, a series of list items. There, there isn't like L1. It isn't like with the headers. Um, in a list, all the list items are considered to be on the same level. So you just have a list item. So let's go and save that and refresh in the browser. And there you see you have a bulleted list of items. All right. Now, if I were to make this, like let's say I got advice from a vet that said you should feed your rabbit in this order. Hay most of the time, lettuce a little less, carrots a little less, spinach a little less. If there was really like a ranking, I could make that an ordered list and then it would put numbers next to it instead of the bullet points. Yes? Good question. In, no, in comments you look like this. So comments are done in many programming languages where you want to have, um, you want to put something in your code as like a reminder to yourself, but you don't want the world to see it. In HTML you do this, I think. Here is a comment. So you do like that. So if I wanted to just remind myself where I got this information and I didn't want to show it on the page, I could say, info obtained from Dr. Smith, my vet, or something like that. That way it wouldn't show up on the page. So, if, you know, these are kind of notes to yourself. Um, and and they, they, uh, you can put them in to sort of help you remember, like, what you did, if you need to change it, and so on. So now if we look at this, notice that we don't see that comment anywhere, and yet it's in the, it's in the web page. We'll go over one other tag today, and that is a tag for a link. All right, we have a couple minutes left. We can we can do that. A tag for a link is a little bit different than the other tags that we've looked at so far, because we have to give additional information. Namely, we have to say what web page is it a link to. So, it's enough to say that this is the title of the page. That's enough information for the browser to know what to do with it. It's a title, I'm going to put it up in the title bar. It's an H1, it's a top level heading. A UL, it's an unordered list. With links, however, the question is, a link to what? Alright, a link to which of the billions of web pages that are out there? Well, I have to supply that additional information. I have a link, and oh yeah, it's a link to Wikipedia page. All right. I have a link, and it's a link to the American Veterinary Association's page about rabbits. All right, and so on. So, I'm going to make this word, Wikipedia, a link to the Wikipedia site. So. The tag for a link is an eight, or as an A, rather. The additional information, namely what page it's linked to, is done in what is called an href attribute. And notice how I'm putting this on a different line. 
Remember, that doesn't matter. I'm just doing it because I think it's more readable to look like this. So I have my start A tag, but notice that part of the start A tag is this little href thingy. That is known as a property. A property is an extra characteristic of a tag. So, H2s don't really need any extra characteristic, it's an H2. All right. I can, I can just say that and I'm fine. Links, however, it doesn't make sense for me to say, hey, this is a link. A link to what? I'm not telling you. All right? It doesn't make any sense, right? So when I have a link, I need to specify what it's a link to. So the way that you provide additional information about a tag is through a property. All right? It'd be almost like me saying, um, can you go to my car? You know, can you go to my car and get something for me? Well, which one of those thousands of cars is your car? Well, I could tell you the make and model and the color and, and maybe the license plate number. All these are characteristics of my car that would distinguish my car from everyone else's. Well, with the link tag, we need to distinguish which page we're linking to. So we do it with href. So the starting tag consists of a href equals, and within there is the address of the page that we're linking to, Starting with HTTP, usually what I do as a good rule of thumb is I will go to that page and then I will copy the URL and paste it there. And save it. Now, notice the word Wikipedia is between the start A and end A. That is the text that you're going to click on, or the, rather that the user is going to click on to take you to that page. So if I view this in the browser, notice that information about can be found on Wikipedia. And if I click on that, I go to Wikipedia. Now, tags come in pairs. Tags identify what that particular content means. Tags need to be nested properly, that is, contain in each other. The way that you indent or put space on your web page really doesn't matter. So much of HTML is just learning the common tags that you're going to use. All right? And learning a, you know, learning a handful of rules about how to use them. That doesn't mean that you know, we'll make it through next week and call it a semester. All right? Because there's a lot of tags that we need to learn. And we also need to learn about CSS, which will allow us to style the page. You know? Hey, this is the start of a decent page, but it sure doesn't look particularly good. Uh, it looks pretty boring. This looks like the way web pages were back in the you know, late 90s, maybe. All right? Well, we can do so much more with that, and that's what we'll spend a lot of time on in this class. Key things to remember, when you save the file, you need to save it as a .html file. And you do that by going to Notepad and changing it from text documents to all files. And then you can put in the .html. I advise you to, be, uh, to change Windows so that you can view the extensions. And then when you open up the, uh, the thing, go into Notepad. And again, click File Open and change it from text files to all files. And then you can select and open the file that you want. Yes? Yes, that would matter. It would matter because if the browser saw that, if that's your question, it would think that that is the href tag. All right? This isn't, a href is not a tag. 
A is the tag part of it. href is an additional information about it. So I say, hey, I have an A tag, but here's some additional information about it. All right, so the name of the tag for a link is an A. So I have A space, and then I have the additional information. If I ran it together, it would think that there was some sort of a href tag, which there isn't. href is, strictly speaking, known as an attribute. It's not really part of the tag. It's additional information about the tag. In this case, additional information about the a tag. Other questions? Um, you should have enough to finish your first assignment now. Um, the lab, remember, the lab is your time, but remember the word lab implies a place to experiment. So take what I've done in the lectures and play around with it. What if I do this? What if I do that? I read in the book that I could do this. All right. I don't necessarily think it's a good idea for me to cover the book page by page, so I don't. You know, you're expected to read it and try some of the things that you see there and try to incorporate those onto your page. All right, we'll see you up in lab.